Every single sentence that you produce should not have existed anywhere else in the universe before. I find that to be a very inspiring idea. It's about structure. You want the structure to be so graceful that you don't notice it. That's what we're doing when we're writing. We're polishing our ideas and then giving. And that's why so many opportunities come to writers. Amaze me. That's my first principle to the writers. Tell me something that I have no idea about in a way that I'm gonna find surprising. I love this. This is very embodied feeling about what good writing is. Blow me away, fire me up. We were talking last night about the Whole Earth Catalog and how in every edition you would try to piss off mm -hmm. like one fifth of the people. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. So the idea is I was editing a magazine that was about what I call um, unorthodox conceptual news. Yeah. It was a lot about ideas. And um, I felt that we were making our mark when one fifth of the people were kind of provoked by that to maybe write in or say something. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be sure that it was a different one fifth each issue. Yeah. And I'd kind of like rotate, not meaning that there was five of them, but that I just, so that, they weren't the same overlapping group of people. And, um, and so, 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 so if there was some, I wouldn't say outrage, but if there was some disturbance, that would mean that we kind of had reached it. And if, and if it wasn't, we were hearing nothing and nobody was a little bit kind of, um, as I said, disturbed by it, then it was like, hmm, we didn't really quite go far enough because we wanted to kind of um, advance the, the concepts, advance the conversation, and to do that, you have to, you have to, you have to, there has to be a little bit uncomfort hmm. in doing that. How do you validate that? I, I found for me, the retreat to honesty is the thing. Like if, if you really have uncommon honesty about it, that you're able to, to do that. And um, so the one of the things I do when I'm writing is in that secondary pass, not the Genesis pass where you don't want to have your editor going but the secondary pass where you begin to evaluate i is i question almost every single sentence and with two questions one is um do i really believe this mm. um and two am, am, am i just sort of is this a phrase that would have occurred somewhere else like ideally every single sentence that you produce should not have existed anywhere else mm. in the universe before. I think, I, I think that sentence I just said was probably like that. Maybe, I don't know, but that's what would be my hope. That has really literally never been said before. Um, and so, to do that, one is, is like, do I really believe that? Am I just kind of parroting it? And then two, secondly, am I saying it in a way that has not been said before? And then when you're doing that with that kind of honesty, you're likely to, to hit a bone. You're likely to hit something. You're more likely to hit it than if you were just parroting something that has been said before. What does that honesty feel like? It feels great <laughs> because you're being authentic, but you're saying something that you, it's, it's a release, it's a, re, uh, it's a relief, it's, um, it feels good. And you can, at that moment, say, uh, that's me, that's I am, I'm revealing myself. I'm saying something, I'm contributing. So, so in all ways, it feels very good. And that may be some mark about whether or not um, it is honest. We're talking about your career and you said, I wish I did more. That was in response to um, your comment that, that there were some things I had said or written that had been picked up by, um, by the culture. And that's what I wished I had done more of, being able to succeed in that sense. Hmm. Not that I had written more words. I, I've written plenty of words. I don't, I don't want to write more words. I just want to write more words that have, that land, that yeah. have some impact. And so, how do you do that? How do you write the words? Well, what I know and what I have seen, the only way to do that is to write a lot of words. Hmm. <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, if we could get to the point where we only produce great stuff, Yes, of course, that's, that's the magic bullet. But the only recipe that I have ever seen for writing great stuff has been to write a lot of stuff. So how much of this is I need to write more and how much of this is I need to publish more? Here's the retreat to honesty. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't like writing. I'm not a natural writer. I write reluctantly. I'm a reluctant writer. I'm a born editor. Yeah. I love editing. That first draft is just a killer for <laughs> Abysmal. me. Abysmal. <laughs> it just, I just, I'm unhappy. I'm grumpy. Um, I procrastinate. I don't like to do it. And I realize that when I'm doing it, I'm not a writer. Because uh, here's the thing is I, at Wired and at Whole Earth, I worked with writers and I worked with some great writers who love to write, who have to write every day or they're feeling uncomfortable, um, who write in a, you know, um, in the way that I edit. They, they, they like doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not one of those people. And I don't write fast. I'm a very slow writer. I don't even type fast. And so um, it's just uh, an ordeal for me to, to write. I love having written. <laughs> and that is really great. Way better than writing. Way better than writing. <laughs> and so, um, but once I get something down, then I can begin to kind of work. And then it's sort of, well, oh, now I can get into it. And so, I wish I would succeed more often. And it's not a matter of writing more, I don't think. I think that I might have more success or my writing might have more success when it veers to the practical and helpful. The metaphor that was coming to mind for me as you were talking about editing was pottery. Yes. The pottery wheel. So, you have something there but you're shaping it yep. through contraction and expansion. Where does the editing happen? Are you a computer editor, iPad? I'm migrating almost everything to, to the computer. Um, but I do, at one stage, we'll print things out and with a red pen, you know, it, but that's kind of pretty later on and just, just to go through um, because there's something about um, seeing it in a different form and that, that's helpful. But uh, the editing... The editing process, I, I just kind of go back and forth the entire way. It's not like I just write and then I edit. It's write, edit. I, I usually like to, to reread and edit the stuff the next day that I've written the day before, kind of go through it. So, um, so it's a back and forth dance the whole way. Talk to me about Marshall McLuhan, the patron saint of Wired. The thing about Marshall McLuhan, which I think he would approve of. Yeah. Is that I've never read him, but I've only heard what he said. Yeah. Which is, you know, his whole point. Yep. I, I tried reading him, and I was like, man, I'm just bouncing off. It hurts your head. Yeah. It's like, whoa. <laughs> I'd heard bits of McLuhan and his thesis, which is that um, the medium that you're writing has more influence on your thoughts than the actual content of what's inside, which uh, is a brilliant idea. And, um, but Louis Rosetto, who was, you know, the principal co-founder of Wired, um, was a big fan of McLuhan. And he said, when we're doing our masthead, this old-fashioned idea of the masthead in a magazine, which is the, the credits, the, 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 you know, the assignment, the roles, um, he said, I wanted to, I, I wanted to have uh, Marshall McLuhan on the masthead. What should we call him? And I, like, instantly, I just said, he's our patron saint. And this was a joke in some ways, because if you know anything about McLuhan, he was very Catholic. And so, I thought, okay, he's going to be our patron saint. And um, so, he was. And that was sort of the, the homage to um, the guy whom I had not really read very much. But um, it was kind of a very wired thing to do at the time. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you say it was a joke because when you talk about a lot of your writing and your best ideas, you're like, hey, they are jokes. That's where they. <laughs> that's where they're born from. It's it's in a state of goofiness and play. And yeah. Those are the ideas that you should trust. And that was the fun part about Wired was that um, we were making a magazine that we wanted to read that did not exist, and so the audience for this magazine was 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 us making a magazine that we wanted to read ourselves. So we're going to have these writers make the magazine that we want to read, and so. Um, we had total control and it was total fun in terms of doing whatever we wanted to do. And there was no, at that time, nobody else to, um, to ask permission for. And so, um, so that having, having fun was definitely part of the, part of the mix. And, that, and by the way, that was my instructions to the writers. Most 
particularly in the tech world, most um, writers, newspaper writers were kind of um, trained to um, target their writing to like the 11th grader or something like that, kind of low bar. And I told the writers, look, okay, here's, here's, here's who you're writing to. You're writing to me. Mm. And I am bored by most of what I read. You have to amaze me. Hmm. Come amaze me. Tell me something that I have no idea about in a way that, I, that you're gonna, I'm going to find surprising. And if you mention DNA, you do not have to explain it. Yes. I know DNA. Yes. Okay. You know, I know whatever it is. I'm reading everything. So you really have to amaze me. I love this. This is very embodied feeling about what good writing is. You right. have to amaze me. Yeah, amaze Blow me, me. away. Fire that's, me up. That's, that's, that was our thing. Amaze me. That's my first principle to the writers. Is that something that you think about for yourself? So I would try to write up whenever I could rather than to write down. And when I'm writing articles for Wired and stuff, I generally try to write up. And by that, I mean um, not having to explain everything, but explaining enough Figuring, you know, my friend, how much do you understand about chat GPT? Well, right. you probably know some of it. I don't have to introduce everything, but there's some things. And so, that kind of like, I'm going to be aiming there, but it's going to be slightly up rather than having to explain everything. One of the things is I was reflecting on your career that I just admire so much is you've just been so connected to an internal joy and radiance and you haven't let yourself deviate from that. Right, right, right. So... There's a bit of advice in the book that we might talk about. We're going to talk um, about it. Which is that um, the thing that made you weird as a kid might make you great as an adult if you don't lose it. So, so yes. So, I have um, really, really tried through my career not to have a career or not to think of it as a career. To really, like I'm, unfortunately my wife complains, I'm not going to retire because there's never been any difference between what I do for play and what I would do in my time off and what I do when I'm working. I mean, they're identical. They're the same thing. There's, I mean, there's nothing. Like, one of the things I do is um, I'll continue to write for Wired about one article a year. And what it is, is when I, f when I have something that I don't know what I think about and I don't know about it, I get a, an assignment. Mm. And the assignment is me basically being paid to figure out what I think about something, mm -hmm. to give me, s and, and, and that's the principal reason why I write, is really not to communicate to other people. Yeah. I write to find out what I think about it, because I'm not the kind of person who has an idea and then I'm going to sit down and write it out. It's the opposite. I don't know what is, and, and I attempt to write what I know, and I write one sentence, and I realize, oh my gosh, I have, I have no idea what I'm saying. This just doesn't make any sense. This reminds me, have you ever seen the series of sketches from Picasso where he starts with a fairly complicated bowl, gets a yeah, little bit more yeah, complicated, yeah. and then eventually at the end, he's left with the essence right, of the right, bowl? Right, right, right. I think that what's so illuminating about that is he can't get to the essence of the bowl unless he goes through oh, yeah. all the different right, stages. Right, right, right. And so, so I sit down and then I say, I need to go back and do some more interviews and whatever it is. And then I okay, now I understand it. Okay. And then I, then I write the next sentence. It's like, well, I, I really don't know what this, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And I go back and forth. And so this is, this, this very painful process of me trying to write. And as I'm writing it, that's when I have the idea. I, I get the idea literally in the act of writing. That act of writing it down, trying to put it out makes and gives me the idea. It's, so, it's like I didn't have the idea before. It's like I'm like being channeled. I'm sort of like in some ways opening up, the writing is opening up this space or process to allow the idea to be formed in a hands by, and so if I don't write it, I won't have that idea. How much do you feel like you're, you're writing or like the writing is almost coming out of you and you're not even in control? It, it, it's, yeah, both. Both. Yeah, there, there, there is a sense in which, where did that come from? Because I didn't have that a minute before I started to write. It's like I'm writing, it's like sometimes people have it while they're talking. You say something, it's like, huh, that was a good thing. Yeah. I mean, saying it generated it. And so, that's, so I write to think. So, help me square these two things. On one hand, 
you write when it's time to write. You're the, the reluctant writer. Right. On the other hand, a lot of ideas emerge while you write. Right. So what creates the impetus and the momentum and the the big bang of the Kevin Kelly writing sphere? How does that begin? So like, okay, so, so something interesting comes along and, and, and I think I have a, a good nose for the editorial knows for what's new but potentially important. And so I'm looking at this and I'm saying there's something important going on. And, and there's, we can talk about what those signs might be, but often there's new language or it's causing other people to freak out or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, I'm paying attention to that and saying, that's really interesting. I don't know anything, I don't know much about it. I don't know what to think about it. Um, but I feel that this is going to be really important. So I, I, I should, I, and, and so there's something about it that appeals to me. So this is going to be an assignment. And I, I'm going to figure this out, figure out what I think about it, figure it out if I have a take on it, figure it out. And then I'll, I'll, I'll make that into a project, whether it's you know, an article or whatever it is, or just a blog post. It's just I'm going to attend to this. And then that begins that process of, I write something, it's like, oh, no, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I don't believe that or yeah. whatever. Okay, we're going around. Um, talk to more people, have, have been saying, oh, there's, there's something interesting I just said or I just wrote. I need to kind of, and so there's this investigation, this stance of a conversation with myself in some ways. I like the idea of a nose. And you have had an amazing sense of like intellectual smell for a long time. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Isn't that, doesn't that come from the whole earth catalog? So you begin there and you've always had this nose. And I think that something you've been very good at is injecting yourself into what you call mm. seniuses. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be a very inspiring idea. Mm -hmm. So how has your nose interacted with the environments that you've curated for yourself? It's funny because no one's really asked about that, but I think that's really crucial. Um, I, I, I think I picked up this, or I was attracted to Stuart Brand because he's actually the OG of this. He is, his life is the Forrest Gump yeah. of our world because he has been at the edge and the frontier and the forefront of almost most of the cultural yeah. movements. And, um, you know, like in 1972, he wrote an article for Rolling Stone about computer hackers. Mm -hmm. 72. <laughs> it's like, he, there it was. He was, and it was, there was some machines in the, <clears throat> excuse me, basement of Stanford. And there were these long hair guys playing Star Wars. And it's like, he saw it. He saw the, and then he kind of just decided to, to hang out at that um, frontier. So, I wrote a book uh, called Out of Control that was published in 94. It was written late 80s and early 90s. And I had a whole chapter on digital encrypted money because I, I found those guys really interesting talking about crypto, basically. But there wasn't blockchain. There mm -hmm. was other forms of encryption. And that was so much of a, um, of a scene that when we started Wired, I assigned um, Stephen Levy to kind of follow up and, and he eventually wrote a whole book about that. So, um, so I like, um, you know, f finding, identifying, looking for seniuses and we'll explain what that is. And then um, trying to hang around and seeing if there's something I don't understand that I want to write about in order to understand it myself. Talk about what a senior is. So a senior is a term that Brian Eno coined. It was his observation that a lot of the great artists of the world, that their genius kind of flowered primarily when they were in a group of others who were egging each other on. They were, they were urging. They were slightly competing. They were trying to outdo and show off to each other. They were, they were the audience of their art was in some ways each their other, peer, each other, their peers. That structure produced really, really great. Um, works and that even people who were not or by themselves would not have been as great were amplified by being part of a, a, a of a group and he called that group a seniors. There was kind of like it's like a collective genius. The 
the genius of a scene. And part of what you want to do is, um, we, ideally, you like to create these. And, and so I, I took Brian's idea and I was kind of applying it broader to say, um, while there are seniuses beyond this, say, you know, the Paris in the 20s or whatever, um, and, and what would they be and maybe what are some of the commonalities between them? And so I looked at things like the um, Xerox Park or the Skunk Works at Lockheed or Camp 34 in Yosemite where all the climbing, the outdoor climbing world and outdoor gear was invented. There was a, there was a group of um, undesirables <laughs> who were hanging out, <laughs> climbing all day and inventing the world of um, adventure sports. And so... Um, I kind of made a stab at it, but it's something, going back to wish I did more of, that I probably should have followed through and really done more work and writing on that could have been very helpful to people. Like, well, how do I either find a seniors or make one? And some of the qualities that seniors share are this sort of, there's a inside and outside, but it's a very permeable mm. It's much more permeable than, say, having a corporation where you have to, you're literally an employee or not. It's kind of more binary. So they have a more, they do have an inside, but it's a porous mem membrane in and out. And that's one of the differences between a senior and, say, a company. Yeah. It's something we think a lot about with Rite of Passage. How do we curate writers? in a way that they can come together. And one of the things I'm getting from what you're saying right now is the right blend of supportiveness and competition. I think where a lot of the seniors is happening right now is YouTube. Hmm. These little YouTube groups where someone has something, they've discovered how to modify a, you know, a harbor freight, cheap harbor freight into something really cool. And then someone else, sees that, mm, that's a great idea, my friend did that, I'm going to modify it a little bit more and I'll make my video and it goes back out and then two days later someone else's. And so you see this, this I mean, the, the, the really good YouTubers are watching all the other YouTubers in mm -hmm. their little seniors. And mm -hmm. so, it, but it's kind of invisible and you know, I can talk forever about YouTube because I think it's way, way underappreciated in terms of the amplification and accelerant it's having on our culture. If you walk into a bookstore, you can kind of see, oh, there are all the books and here's the range of books. And you can see there's lots of things over in the self-help, astrology, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You get a map of it. There's no map for YouTube. There's, there's no sense of how deep and how vast what's going on, what's going on. There's, there's no outside or easy look at it. It's like, not like a magazine stand where you can kind of see, oh my gosh, there's lots of gun magazines. And so... Um, so, so we don't really appreciate it, but but like it's it's like brain surgeons. It's not like hobby. It's like brain surgeons who are posting or making videos of their operations, and they do a little innovation, and all the other brain surgeons are watching it, and then they go and they try something their next time, and they make a video of it and post it, and there is this, this acceleration and speed at which this is happening. So there's a lot of seniors in the YouTube verse. But it's basically invisible to most people. You have the concept of a thousand true fans. How has that impacted your work? I mean, certainly there's books like Vanishing, Vanishing Asia, where that was funded by obsessive, obsessive fans. Right. It was a Kickstarter funded. It was actually, I didn't learn, <clears throat> excuse me, I just learned this recently, but it was the second biggest nonfiction book uh, funded in, in, in Kickstarter it's history. It's so beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's an overwhelmingly obsessive book. Um, <clears throat> it's extravagant. And, it's um, totally extravagant. Yes. It's extravagant and self-indulgent. But that's what I think is great about A Thousand True Fans yes. is that we can be followers of the Kevin Kelly wins and basically surrender to you and basically say, we're huge fans of what you're doing yeah. and wherever you take us, right. we will go. The Thousand True Fans started off as a theory that I had, and it was something that I was kind of like talking around to people for years, and then I kind of um, thought I should write this down, <laughs> and then as soon as I began to write it down, I had all these ideas about it, 
And I said, okay, this is this this could be useful. But it was, I was, it was before there was Kickstarter or Patreon. There there wasn't any of the crowdfunding. And I was saying, in theory, this should work. And then people like my friend Jaron Lanier were pretty critical of it, saying, you know, this is not happening. The 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 people who are now surviving or or, or, or living off of a thousand true fans, they started off with studios or publishers they had them and they move there there's no organic growth of people who are indigenously starting with a thousand true fans and going up and i investigated around and there might have been one or two people but it was kind of iffy whether they actually had the help of, of, a, of another um, career but since then without a doubt i mean i get emails all the time from people saying I took that and I've done it and it started me off. And I'd say Substack is right. largely built on this idea. Exactly, right. So 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 by now it's no longer a theory. And again, I'll explain later on, but I have not done the follow up book on this. Okay. Of of you know, the book. I, I still have my original piece and then the, the version that I uh, that I rewrote for for Tim Ferriss. Um and you, to be practical, to be helpful, a book about it should be written. And I'll explain why I haven't written it. So, one of the pieces of uh, advice in this little book is um, don't, be, don't aim to be the best, be the only. Of course, that's a classic Kevin Kelly trope. And to have a deadline because what a deadline prevents you from doing is being perfect. So, you have to be different. Well, there's another piece of, of advice for young people, which is, if at all possible, try to work on something or somewhere where there's no name for what it is that you're doing, where you may have difficulty explaining to your mother what it is, because that is the spot where the breakthroughs happen, when there's no name. So, it's like, it's like 10 years ago, you're kind of like, you're doing podcasting. You're just like, well, hey, it's kind of like radio, but it's not quite radio. It's sort of... And so... You're at you're at the you're at the good spot, and part of that is is about not being the best, not aiming for the best, but to be the only, and that is an incredibly high bar. That takes most of us, including me, most of my life to arrive there to figure out what that is. There may be some prodigies who are born who very early on have some notion of what it is that they can do better than other people, but most of us is going to take a long journey, and that's why most successful people's lives are kind of like, they're like <laughs> detours, backtracking, hard rights, uh, dead ends, um, because they're on this journey of kind of figuring out this really good thing. And they might arrive finally at the place where they're doing something that only they can do. So, go back to, to, to the book is that while I was at Wired, I, I learned very early on that the hardest, one of the most difficult, it wasn't the most time consuming, but one of the most difficult parts was headlining the stories, making the headlines and making the covers. And we'd have this tremendous intellectual battles and just, just, just purpose in trying to ex extract out what the headlines and the covers was. So I said, oh, well, oh, we're doing this backwards. Let's start with the covers and the headlines and then make the article back. Let's see what that is. What that, so, so let's, what are some of the, most ideal, greatest covers we could imagine for Wired, and we'll make them happen. If, you know, we'll say, is this possible? D is there any evidence for this? And so, we would go back f from that. That produced means that we would have story ideas and then we'd have story assignments. And so, um, for writers, we'd say, we're trying to pitch the story, trying to find a writer for it. Sometimes writers come to us with stories, it goes both ways, but we would commission a lot of stories. and. Um, one of the things I noticed about commissioning stories is I would have a great idea, often, that I just couldn't sell to anybody. And they were, eh, I'm not that interested, or that's not a good idea, or I'm eh, boring, you know, whatever. So, that's, that's just normal for things. Okay, here's some more ideas. And, um, but occasionally, there would be um, an idea that I would want to come back to. I would say, 
you know, whatever it was, a year later, I think that's a really great idea. We need, we need to do this. And I would try to sell it again and nobody. And then it could maybe come back a third time. And I'd try to sell it and it wouldn't work. And then I would say, hmm, okay, I see what's happening here. I think it's a great idea. Um, no one else wants to do it. This is one I have to do. Okay? And those are often being my best pieces. And um, the thing about it is that at that point, there's no, I don't have to worry about someone else coming along and doing it because I've spent two years trying to give it away. Right. And so I would talk about the things I'm working on all the time in the hopes that someone else will steal it. And whew, I don't have to write that one. Man, you really are lazy, huh? Right. I don't have to write that one. I only want to write the things that only I can do. Right. And that's why I haven't done the Thousand True Fans book, because somebody else could do that. I'm interested in where ideas come from. And in this book, Excellent Advice for Living, you wrote this on your 68th birthday, the original blog post that this came out of. And you wrote 68 pieces of advice yeah, yeah. for your kids. So tell me about these Genesis stories for your books. So, um, again, this was sort of an inadvertent book. I didn't intend to write a book when I started. I um, was in the habit of writing down mantras that I liked, that I, that I could repeat to myself to change my behavior. Hmm. An example would be, um, if, if I know I have something in my household and, and I can't find it, and, and then I look for it and I finally find it, the little mantra that I, that, that I began repeating to myself is, don't put it back where I found it. Put it back where I first looked for it. Or another piece is um, when I get an invitation to do something, to speak, to travel, to meet someone for coffee, to, um, you know, appear somewhere, whatever it is, I always ask myself, um, would I do this if it was tomorrow morning hmm. as a filter? And mostly it's like, no. Hmm. You know, even though six months, it's going to be tomorrow morning and then I'm going to say, you know, I wish I wasn't doing this. So, so I ask myself, um, you know, would I do this tomorrow morning? That kind of immediacy filter. And so I was writing these kinds of things down to help me condense that kind of, to help change my own behavior. And I was realizing that um, some of these things took me a long time to kind of arrive at. And I wished I had known them earlier. And, um, as, and so in our family, with our kids, um, we try to train them and model behavior rather than giving advice. I, we just weren't in advice giving mode. So I never gave my kids advice. And um, uh, I just actually sent the book uh, to my son and I said, you know, what do you think? And he says, it's kind of weird because even though you never said of these things, we got the message. Right. So, so, but I thought it would be useful to them and others to have it written down they, so they could do what I do, which is kind of like have a little mantra that would help them. And so, I began writing these down and I thought that uh, I would do the Irish hobbit thing of giving away presents on my birthday. And um, they went viral when they were shared to the family and then more than that. And so, I thought I'd do that again next year. And... I had more to say than I thought. Mm -hmm. It's funny. You have, a, you have a line that it probably applies less to this yeah. book, but definitely applies to your other books that you should really write the book after you do the speaking tour for yes. the book yes. because you're constantly speaking and refining over and over, writing from conversation. Yeah, yeah. And then every single time that you're talking about, hey, this is yeah, what's yeah, in the yeah. book. Here's the core idea. Now you have the essence right. and uh-oh, the book was published a year ago. Yeah, no, I, it's absolutely 100% correct. I mean, if I knew what I knew now about the book, I should really rewrite it and it would be much better because now I know what it's about. So, the, my, one of my books, The um, New Rules for the New Economy, which has been very overlooked. Um, you have a great article about that too. I have an article. I started on an article and that's what it was, is I was giving that talk. I love that article. I was giving that as a talk for years and therefore I, could, I wrote the book very, very fast because I'd already been talking about it for several years. Yeah. And so, um, so that's another way to, to, to write a book is if you talk about it first and then, and then write it. Is that something that you cultivate consciously? No, I, I think, um, so I'm doing a talk at South by Southwest on um, the AI chatbots and generative art. And I wrote a little bit of it, but it's really hard because I mean, because I'm still thinking about it. I'm still figuring it out. I haven't given it. This is the first time I'm ever talking about it. Not at all ready for a book, but maybe 
in a couple of years? It might be, but I have to say one other thing, which might be a little, what's the word I want? Um, radical for, yeah. for this conversation. Um, I, I have promised myself that I, I'm not going to do any other native books, books native. What does that mean? I think the, the center of the culture has moved away from books to moving images, to hey. video. That is the center of the culture. My kids are not reading books. Their friends are not reading books. They're watching YouTube. And that is now the center of the culture. So I, I, I wanted to do something that's n native to that. And they can have like a spin off book hmm. that comes out of it, but it's not, that's not the native thing. The native thing that I want to be, I want to be present in this arena where all the, all the attention is. I have a little media, tiny little, little media empire where we do, a, we do newsletters, we do some podcasts for a long time, we do a daily blog for 20 years, um, you know, I have books and stuff, and the social media and YouTube channels, and the only place where we see a growing audience is in YouTube. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about spending time with you is you're remarkably calm for somebody who's so productive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, um, I don't know why, but yes, I am um, uh, able to be very calm and calm is contagious. I wrote a blog every day for 20 years and also I'm a reluctant writer. Yeah. How are those two things existing <laughs> in the same person? That to me feels like something that we need to just go at and figure out what's right, happening right, right, there. Right. That's magical. Well, so my daily blog, I, I was not writing it. It was a cool tools blog. I, I have my own blog where I was writing, but that was but you're not doing cool way. tools, recommendo, oh, screen yeah, publishing, yeah, right. street use. I mean, there's so many different ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, most of those are more abundant now, but I have the technique where I try to write often. Actually, I have in my Notion thing, I have probably a hundred things that I have written but not published because, um, um, what's the word I want? Um, because I haven't gotten over that habit. I, I switched to trying to do daily art every day. Mm. And I was committed to that, to kind of switch away from the, um, the text only. And so also to, to learn new tools and, and skills. So, um, and where I'm hoping to go is to, to, to release like a video every week. And so I also have been recording tons and tons of video, mostly in my making mode, but I'm, been really hard. it's been really difficult for me to gain enough uh, abilities to edit to be able to do it because i because every time uh, i don't know what it is but but my mind keeps forgetting the it's like learning a language uh -huh. these softwares are so complicated mm -hmm. that it's like learning a language and i haven't gotten conversationally fluent enough right. to not even think about it i, I can do that in Photography, I don't even think about it. I can do it almost blindfolded in a certain way. David McCullough has a line where he says that learning to paint taught him how to write because writing and painting are both seeing and they're right. different ways of seeing. Right, right, right. How has the That's photography that you've done influenced your writing? The, one of the reasons why I photograph is to see it's, and that's why I draw is, is that you like particularly if you're drawing something real, you can't draw that without really, really seeing it. And, and most of the time you're spent is looking at the thing, trying to, to comprehend it. Yeah. Photography for me was uh, an excuse to go see things. Hmm. And, and I use that that way. It's like if I hadn't had photography, I would not have traveled anywhere near the extent that I have. And that book is a reflection of the fact that I have been almost everywhere in Asia and I claim, and I'm waiting for someone to refute that I've been to more places in Asia than anybody alive hmm. or probably everybody who's lived. And so, um, and that photography was that kind of propulsion, the, the excuse to go out and spend all day looking and interacting and seeing. One thing that we were talking earlier about, you spend so much of your life trying to figure out what your purpose is yes. and, and sort of the meandering that right, you were talking right, about. Right. 
But I think that there's something about the connectedness to what you are innately drawn to uh -huh. and just trusting that and yeah. going with it. And yeah. you have that in spades. One of my bits of advice in the book is that in your 20s, you should spend a good hunk of your time doing something that is obviously not successful or success oriented, <laughs> that it's weird, crazy, unpredictable, unprofitable. Um, something people are going to mock you for, maybe. You might be mocked for right. that is um, silly and extravagant and dumb and in any way as far from success as you can imagine. And that time and that stuff that you do will become the, your touchstone and the thing that you will go back to to generate your success later on. Hmm. And so, so, so I'm a big believer in sabbaticals and sabbaths and taking time off and goofing off. Mm. What does that mean to you? Where you are, you have no agenda for what you're doing other than the, the pleasure and the, the thing itself. I did a, um, a drawing, piece of painting, uh, and posted it every day for a year. There's, there's no, I have no agenda. There was like, I'm doing it and posting it only because that act of, of doing it was pleasurable. And this book of 50 years of photography, I was doing it, again, almost like a compulsion. There was no economic possible reason for, for doing it. There was no demand for, we need pictures of the disappearing cultures of Asia. Yeah. There's, nobody was saying that. Nope. You didn't and, hire McKinsey to do uh, and there was two by two access. This was the best, most efficient thing exactly. to do. So this sort of um, playfulness, generative creativity that I think people should do more of and I would recommend that for the pleasure and not always be thinking about the productivity success part of it because you can, you can do that because I can guarantee you that it will be later on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird thing of the universe. It's like this other weird paradox of the universe that makes no sense whatsoever, which is that the more you give, the more you get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense that, that the most selfish thing you can do is to be selfless. Mm -hmm. That if you really were aiming to get a lot, you have to give away a lot. That's a fundamental paradox. But that is so reliable. I mean, most of the major religions of the world kind of based on that. That's utterly, you can count on it. And so, this is part of it. So that, you know, playing around, being generative, creating, even if it's just for yourself, is by far, in the long view, the most selfish thing you could do. I mean, you could say writing is a form of giving at scale. Absolutely. That's what we're doing when we're writing. We're polishing our ideas and then giving. Right. And that's why so many opportunities come to writers. I, I feel you have a duty mm. to share your art. Mm. Otherwise, you're kind of cheating us with your life. Huh. A duty. A duty. You have a duty to write, to do art for yourself because that's only how you're going to express your genius and that's i mean my my goal is to increase learning and to increase the options and opportunities that, so that everybody on the planet born and yet born would have the opportunity to share their particular genius and i think we often need technology to do that so the little story that i tell is imagine if mozart had been born before there was the piano invented or the symphony sure he would been and maybe he could make some kind of music in, you know, thousands of years ago, but what a loss to us and to him if um, he wasn't born after this was invented. And then, or, or Hitchcock, mm -hmm. born before there was cinema, or Van Gogh, before there was oil paints. What a loss. And so, there is a, a Shakespeare somewhere today who was born... And she's waiting for us to make the technology to allow her genius to be expressed and shared. And so we have a moral obligation to keep increasing those choices and those possibilities. And that's what I am on, is I, I feel a moral obligation 
to enable everybody to have the chance to express their genius. How much of what you say is something that you've written down before? Wow, it's such a good question. I would say a lot of it by now on certain subjects. On certain subjects, a lot. But clearly haven't written about the photography and the writing. So (laughs) (laughs) got to turn that one into a blog (laughs) post. (laughs) Right. But I learned something from my mentor and friend, Stuart Brand. I have observed him for 40 years in all kinds of situations. And he had a particular quirk. So he was invented the whole earth catalog and I've been around, which was 50 years ago, I think. And I've been around multiple times when people come up and say, you know, they want to talk about the whole earth catalog, change their lives, whatever it is. And in those uncountable number of encounters and times I've been around, I've never heard Stuart repeat himself about the whole earth catalog. Is that right? He'll explain it in a completely different way each time. (laughs) Wow. And I've never heard him repeat anything. He'll have a great line. And yet when he's, says it, he'll, 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 make it, he'll try to make a new one. It may not be as good, but it'll be different. And so part of what I try to do is not to repeat like word for word, maybe the basic idea is, but not to just, I mean, to, again, to try and reinterpret it. And um, uh, I'm not always successful as Stuart because I think he has a little quirk in his brain that allows him to do that without much trouble. I had another friend who was an invert, I mean, he was a, he, he couldn't help himself making puns, and it was almost like a, a tick. And I think Stuart has that little bit, like a little tick where he's just like not going to say the same thing again. Well, I've been thinking a lot about like a central question that great artists have, and then how that question actually manifests itself. So they're always orbiting around something, but it manifests itself in all these different ways. Yeah, yeah, Take yeah. Take someone like Rembrandt, the portrait, the way that light shines on the face. Right. So that's a central question that he's constantly right, orbiting right, right, around, right. but the expression of that, the answers that he's bringing out are always changing, always in flux, deeper and deeper every time trying to hit the next layer there. Yes. And uh, most great artists kind of have some larger theme and then we can recognize that and in part that's why they're kind of great because they're extreme in that way. And so I actually think a greatness is kind of over, overrated. All the people that I know who are great, they're, they're extremely great in certain dimensions, but that greatness always has a corresponding weakness. Uh-huh. And they are great because they're extreme in that fashion, which also exposes this extreme weakness in another area. And so, so there's a high price to pay for greatness. What price have you paid? I'm not great. Yeah, you are. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not. Um, uh, I'm too calm to be great. It's sort of like I'm, uh, I'm much more balanced and um, uh, not that extreme. What trade-offs have you had to make in order to be Kevin Kelly? <laughs> oh, man, that's such a good question. You're not going to like this answer. <laughs> but to be Kevin Kelly, I couldn't be great. You know, uh, let me kind of define great as something, you know, somebody who might be remembered for maybe a generation or two by people outside their family, right? And so it's like, you know, in a generation or two, no one will remember my name or or anything that I did, okay? And so that's, so I'm not in that league of what I would call great, where where you're going to be remembered for a generation later by people outside of your family. And so to, um, to be me now, I surrendered that path towards greatness because I just am not that extreme or fanatical, obsessive about a larger thing. I am much more kind of like a gadfly with lots of little different things going around. And so that doesn't cohere into the kind of extremity that you need to be great. From the time that you've spent with people who are great, maybe great writers we can focus on. Do you think that they have a story inside of their head that they want to be great figures and that that really drives them? Or what are some of the underlying messages that they're telling themselves? Sometimes I think it's closer to obsessions and things Hmm. where where they, they, 
maybe might even recognize the cost to their families or other things by this dedication to perfectionism or the next thing or the number of hours they're putting into it. There might be, and but they can't help themselves. It's just like, you know, I got to do this. And, th- and so oftentimes their spouses might have understood that that was the, that was the bargain. Right. They're going to go into the room and for seven hours and we won't see them. And that's just what it is. I've had the privilege, pressure, uh, whatever you want to call it, of being around some billionaires. Yeah. And, and people that, whose names will be remembered for, for many generations. And their greatness is something that they're sort of grappling with right now. The, the consequences of that and the price that they're paying for it still. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, I look at that. It's like, yeah, that's not what I want. Right. What's a typical writing session look like for you? So, in the generative phase, it's fairly short. You know, I can... Um, maybe go a couple of hours, maybe an hour and a half of writing before I get bored. Bored. Or, or, or I, before I reach the limit of having something to say. Yeah. So, so I'm not, uh, but, uh, let, me, let me distinguish it. Most of my writing is nonfiction. Um, uh, fiction is a different thing. And I have, a limited experience in fiction. But fiction is different than most of the writing that I do. And um, there, it's like I just sort of, I reach the end of what I know or can say at that moment, whether I, or I need to research more or um, it's too muddled and I am just like not happy, whatever. The, the other writing component, the editing thing and improving stuff, I can go much longer there. That's, um, you know, I, 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 I tend to have bigger blocks of time to work on that, partly because kind of, I kind of feel like I have to, have to load the whole thing into the buffer. Mm-hmm. You have to put the whole thing into the buffer, and then it's in the buffer, and then I can start to going. And so that needs a kind of a bigger block of time. And how do you make space in your life in order to have oh, that time? Oh, so I define, and, and that's another bit of advice, I defined um, there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy. Hmm. The rich have a lot of money, the wealthy have time and control of their time. I am one of the wealthiest people on the planet because I have total control of my time and every day is different. And so I work best with deadlines, so I need a deadline. Hmm. Give me a deadline. Do you deadline. set your own deadline? I can set my own deadlines, but I have to have a deadline. And um, um, there's a great book called The Writer's Time. Hmm. And Stuart Brand turned me on to it when he was writing his first book. And the major insight from that was, look, the, wor- the work of creating anything, but particularly a book, is infinite. It's bottomless. The amount of of work, energy, research, writing that could go into your book is unlimited. You can, all, you can always add more. So you can't manage the work, you can only manage your time. Mm-hmm. So there was this idea that you say, like basically, I'm not gonna write the best book, I'm gonna write the best book I can in a year. Sure. Okay, so you're gonna manage your time. And so, and so, w- w- deadlines do that for me. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do the best article I can in, for, the t- for the deadline. Uh-huh. And the deadline is like, you know, it's, it's fantastic because then after the deadline's done, I don't, I abandon the book. I mean, that's, uh, books are abandoned as far as I can tell. And so, um, and so, yeah, I can set my own deadlines. And then, um, so I'm always looking forward to that moment when the first draft is done and I can, then, um, you know, work on these blocks of things and, and try and edit stuff. How much do you think about structure in your writing? All the time. Why is it so important? In fact, that's what I kind of realized the function of the magazine editor was, was primarily structure. That's all we talked about. The magazine or individual pieces or both? No, 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 no both. But most of the conversation about a writer who is writing a story for, the, for an article 
95% of it was about structure. And that's the thing why? Because you want it to disappear. Huh. You want the structure to be so graceful, intuitive, that you don't notice it. So you notice structure when it's absent, and you notice it because, like, there's a jump. There's a, there's a logical hole. There's, you're confused. Um, you're, um, you're unsatisfied. You're, you're, you're distracted. All these things are happening because, because of the lack of the right structure. And when you are kind of smoothly going on and you're kind of like surprised but not confused and all these good stuff, that's because of great structure. And if you read like um, John McPhee, he talks about this all the Draft time. Draft number four. Exactly. It's about structure and, 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 that, and it's really hard to do and you really do need someone outside to help you if it's at all complicated. Great people, great writers like John can, can really do that himself. Um, and that's really what it's about. And so, I, yes, it's, it's about structure and most of the feedback I get, uh, I gave as an editor was about structure and most of the feedback that the editors give me is about structure. If you have the right structure, the words kind of, it's not really about phrasing or other things, it's about structure. Talk to me about enthusiasm. So, I have a piece of advice that, you know, enthusiasm worth, is worth 25 IQ points. And um, that's a little bit more also about optimism and positivity. But it also relates to your hiring advice. Of yes. Hiring people who have that innate love for whatever it is right. and not hiring so much around skills. Right. And you can teach that. That was born out of my experience at Wired. <laughs> okay, so Wired, we had a digital uh, side of, of Wired magazine and Wired, um, you know, created the uh, click-through ad banner, the thing that's ubiquitous now. Um, and so, we were- You guys created that? Yes. Wow. Yes, I'm sorry to say. That's pretty cool. We were on a way to do all kinds of other things if we didn't have the failed IPO. But the thing was, is we were hiring people to develop the web before, just as the web was being invented. So, there were no web developers. So, we're hiring. Um, so, how do you hire? So, we hire for attitude, aptitude, enthusiasm, and then you train for skills. And you think that advice applies as well to writers? I do. Um, it was really interesting hiring like writers and editors. I, I didn't really look at their writing. Huh. It was like, it was the conversations. It's like it was about ideas. It was about again for me, writing is clear. Writing comes from clear thinking, and it was your ability to to think and to have be creative and to have ideas and to structure your arguments. Blah blah blah. The, the, those were were the important things. Talk to so many of our students, and they're dejected because they think they missed the boat of online writing. Mm. And I bring up something you wrote in 2014, you are not too late. Yeah. So, that little mantra is that um, in 20 years from now, certainly 30, but even in 20 years from now, the big thing that everybody will be have, that everybody will need, that everybody will talk about, does not exist today. So, we aren't going to be talking about Facebook. We aren't going to be talking about um, even Google. We aren't going to care about chat GBT. We're going to care about something completely different that hasn't been invented today. And that's going to be the biggest major thing. And that's going to be the biggest company. And so, it's going to be bigger than anything we have today. And so, you, whoever you are, have the chance to be that person inventing it, creating it, writing about it, and all those other things. And so, um, so you're not late. You, 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 the, the, the biggest, you know, looking back, people will say, you know, in 20 years, they'll say, you thought you had AI, you had nothing like AI. AI, this is AI we'll have in 20 years. This is not chess. This is not AI. And so, looking back to now, they're going to say, you know, um, I wished, that what they're going to say is, I wished that I was alive and working in 2023, because that's when it all started. But hasn't all the content been created? There's nothing new to say. 
everything has already been said, but nobody was listening, so we have to say it again. <laughs> I think a lot about that with my teachers. I had a high school physics teacher who was so impactful for me. He didn't come up with any of the ideas. Yeah. Just great at communicating them in a different right, way. Right. Exactly. So there will be new things to say, but there's always new ways to say them, and that's the joy. And I think some of the best people that we appreciate as writers are doing exactly that. There's always this tension between saying something that's familiar in a familiar way or something we have familiarity with, and yet it's, we're saying in a new way, and there's something new and connecting it to the new. So, so there is there is there is always that tension between what we know and what we don't know, and the genius is really in, is in connecting those two together. How consciously did you think about marketing throughout your career? When I began, I didn't really have a clue about marketing or know to the extent that it was important or any interest in it. And I think that is something that I have changed my mind about as I went along. And, um, you know, I think I had the kind of, a lot of people's aversion to sales and selling. Um, but I came to understand that, in fact, packaging is a type of selling. Hmm. Putting a cover on a book is a kind of a marketing. Well, you love book covers. Exactly. And, I, and, and I, so I, I, I've come to, to understand that that is an inherent part of creation to being in that communicating it and trying to share it is necessary and can be creative and so um i mean we can talk specific things um but 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 i have come to appreciate it and i think dan pink wrote a book um to sell this to sell is to human and and i really kind of have, have come have arrived there to understand that that is really an essential element of being creative that you have to communicate in some way if you're going to share it you have the total right to create things and not share it we can't demand it but i think there is as i said some duty to to share things and if we are going to share it then then how we structure it how we market it is an essential element and i um have realize now going into something like a book or even an article that there is that there's a half of a, half the job is in creating it and there's another half which is sharing it and marketing it mm. and so so i'm now prepared and understanding that when i finish writing the book and there's the last sign off on the on the, on the final draft of the galley that i'm now half done i've done 50 percent of the book the other 50 percent is marketing it and so, and I will spend probably more time in total hours than I did writing it. Wow. And that's what I'm going to sign up for. And so, um, and, and that's because, and that's partly because there's been a change in the, in the book publishing business. Okay. So the change is that, I mean, it's really weird if you think about it. Random House Viking, um, books, uh, big publishers like that, they do not have any names any customers because they sell to bookstores right so they don't need so they have no this is the opposite of thousand true fans mm -hmm. they have no engagement with their actual customers can you believe that <laughs> so here's the problem the problem is people are not buying books in bookstores anymore so suddenly they're saying what do we do and so here's what here's what's happening here's the practical advice to to authors is they when you come to sell, sell a book, if they want to know, are you bringing us your audience? Are you bringing the audience to us? And your value to them, because they don't have the audience. People aren't going to bookstores. That's who they were selling to. They don't, how are they going to sell? You have to bring the audience to them as well. And that means that you, that your own, if you have this, your own audience, then you got to do the work of marketing to that audience they'll help but they're not really capable of it so basically i do all the marketing for my books and i have a couple of things that i've been doing that i've seen sell books if you want to talk about that bring it on so um my book on uh 2000 
eight, I can't remember, what technology wants. I said, um, if, if you have a group that will buy um, 25 books, I think it was, and you're within a two-hour drive from in the Bay Area, I'll come talk, I'll do an hour talk hmm. at your place. So buy 25 books, which I thought was more than most bookstores would sell at a book signing. And I'll um, come. And, and so I did that for a month. Uh, as many as I could fit into one month, full time. And it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> because there was like a high school, there was like a church, there was an architect's office, there was Google, there was, I mean, there was the whole range of people. And it was this never ending variety of you know going on location meeting people that i would not have met and it was just fabulous and they had people 25 people read a book and they would often have people who read the book before um, i got there which was really great then i on the next book i decided to widen that by saying i would do a um uh conference call that wasn't it was before zoom um and it was limited i think it was a like google meet or something and they were limited to like 10 people in total so I said, if you had nine people purchase a book, I'll spend an hour and we'll have a group chat with, with 10 people because I was the 10th. And that was anywhere in the world. And so I did that for a month. And then the other book, I said, oh, we'll do podcasts. If you have a podcast, I have a book and we'll do a podcast anywhere. And so... Um, this book has expanded to the same thing, which is um, uh, if you have a podcast with more than three episodes, I'll, you can sign up here and I'll be on your podcast. And I've done that for three months. I do six to eight a day. And um, one after the other, and they solve self-schedule on Calendly. And I find that the podcast audience is, is very intimate. And they have time to go into the book. It's not like radio or TV where you have two, two minutes and 15 seconds. It's like ridiculous. And they're not your audience anyway. Yeah. They're not going to buy books. Yeah. It's the podcasters and the newsletters and, and that kind of intimate um, personal take on it. So I do all the, the marketing and I sign up for that. And I think authors have to understand that that is the landscape today. Talk to me about your relationship with fame because I see <laughs> two interesting things going on where you're a well-known guy yeah. and on the other hand, you have this quote where you say, you really don't want to yeah. be famous. Read the biography of any famous person. So something, you have a way of thinking about fame, a way of curating your, yeah. your reputation, so to speak, that allows you to thread the needle of this. Yeah. Again, you know, fame like richness is all very relative. Right. You know, it's like, uh, you know, if you're in Silicon Valley, what does it take to be rich? It's like a pretty high number. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing. I'm around really famous people. And so, like, I'm not at all famous. I know what fame is like where you're walking down the street and, I mean, literally everybody knows who you are and they want the selfie. Um, that's the kind of fame that you don't want. And... Um, it's a burden. It's like having a billion dollars. The thing I know about, again, about billionaires is that you don't, I can, I can tell you right now, you do not want a billion dollars. Wow. You don't because it's incredible burden. It takes over your life. You have to think about it all the time. It just displaces all kinds of things. It's just not, it's not desirable and you can't spend it anyway. So it's like, it's nice to have some kind of um, attention. Notoriety. Notoriety to be, to be respected. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's nice, uh, and it can be, can be useful. Um, but I, you know, the way I handle it is really to try and exploit the, the thing about it, which is an opportunity to meet people either that I would not have ordinarily met or that I would enjoy. And, and so there's, it's, it's an opportunity and to be respectful of that, to, 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 you know, I, I like to. People say they're a fan. I want to know about them. And um, I mean, I generally do want to know about it. So, so um, there are times, I, you know, in China, I have a lot more fame. Huh. And 
I sometimes need bodyguards there. Is that right? Yeah. At big festivals where there are a lot of my fans. But, um, and that's, that's really weird because I, well, there's language barriers as well, but, but I don't get to find out about them and have more of a symmetrical contact. Yeah. But that's what you get. That's, I mean, so that's why I had some sense of like, well, I couldn't imagine that being in the U.S. That would be terrible. Yeah. You were talking about your writing earlier. When you're writing, you're trying to say, is this true? Mm -hmm. Is this mm -hmm. me? And on the other hand, every idea is, is, is sort of this cross-pollination. Okay, yeah, yeah. And those two things operate in tension. Yeah, I, I may not see as much tension there is, is, is that... Um, I firmly believe that, that almost none of our ideas are original or solo. So I reject entirely the trope of the, gen of the lone genius, okay? Because my investigation of the origins of science and innovation is that simultaneous invention is the norm. Hmm. And that's true not just in science and technology, but also in the arts. And so, um, so I think... Um, that, that, that ideas and concepts and things are networks of things that are very tied to related stuff. And that if, you know, if Einstein, which is true, had not done relativity, there was two other people right behind him would have done so. And, you know, um, Alexander Graham Bell, who patented the telephone, only won the patent because Alicia Gray filed it on the same day, hours, just hours later. So these things are inevitable, including, you know, like if you look at the, the weird things, uh, suits with um, J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter and muggles and stuff, there were tons of writers who were talking about owl messengers and muggles and other kinds of stuff that she claims she didn't read. And I believe that the things were just things that came up from other people. And so, and so in that sense, yes, when we're being original, it's, uh, it's, it's just a tiny step. It's, it's not wholly disconnected from all the other things happening. Um, but we can still honor and respect that little step, that little bit of addition. And so, um, someone else would have come along and done it, but we're still going to reward that with a copywriter monopoly temporarily in order to incent people to try and spend time doing it. And so, I believe that basically all ideas are coming from the commons and to return to the commons as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And that there should be a little tiny gap where we try to incentivize people to spend more time doing it, but it should be as short as possible. Right. And the idea of extending copyright to like whatever it is, 99 years plus, it's just crazy because yep. there's no incentive there. Um, but, you know, I think like 20 years or something. Yep. Okay. That's reasonable for a living artist, maybe for patents too, but, but maybe patents should be even shorter. But there's this idea that the, actually the commons, that these ideas are being generated by the commons and should return there as soon as possible. Something I like to, when I'm talking to Rite of Passage students yeah. and they're struggling, I'll ask them, what kind of information are you consuming? Mm. And you have a word of advice in here, cultivate an allergy to mm. average. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, if you want to be remarkable, read books. Everybody that I admire in my life read more books than I do. Mm. Okay, read. And, and by the way, the best education you can ever give your child is just to read to them. Well, so you had no... TVs in the house. No TVs. Books everywhere. Yes, books everywhere. And we did a lot of reading to them. Um, and my daughter, who is the most reader, is still reading voraciously, uh, not on social media. So, um, uh, so mm -hmm. books and, and, and reading are important, but you really do want to, to, um, read widely and differently. And, and, and a really good trick, by the way, for reading is to read the authors that your favorite authors read. Hmm. Okay? 
that's a great way. So you have some favorite authors, read the people that they're reading and have read. That will get you there. I have another friend whose passion is in reading the bestsellers of the past, which for the most part we have completely forgotten about. Like, like take a random year, like, I don't know, 1913 or whatever, and look at the bestseller list. You'll recognize almost like none of them. It's like, what happened there? They were like the bestsellers. And so he'll go back and read them, and they're, you know, peculiar, different. They're, there's something about them. They were good enough to be the bestseller then, but they're completely forgotten now, and which is a, another lesson about aiming for the bestseller list is, was that, you know, that, that's true in movies too. If you've seen the year by year on yeah. the Oscar movies and which ones win Oscars and which ones we remember, they're not at all related. Hmm. Last question. Why has writing been worthy of devoting your life to in the way you have? Whole Earth Catalog. Yeah. Wired Magazine, all these books, all these blogs. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, no one's asked me that before, but I think because I did not set out to be a writer. Uh -huh. There was never a goal in my life. I had a vision that once I wanted to be a photographer. I began to have something to say or want to something to say. And mostly they were kind of like, I, I joke a little bit that my captions got longer. <laughs> All right, I was like, there's a lot more going on here. So for me, I think writing was a way of sharing what I had learned, but that wasn't enough. I think, as I said, it would became a way for me to figure out what I thought and think. Um, and then I would sh and that sharing part of it was sort of the, the obligation part of it, of, of sharing what I had learned that also help me to write and do it better, the feedback, what worked, what didn't work. So that sharing I came to see as part of that process of learning how to think and write better was, what do people respond to? Do they get it? What, where was I successful or not? And so for me, it's a way of, um, of two things, accessing and helping me think, and then two, to, to, to accomplish my mission because I write about technology and stuff, is to increase the number of options and opportunities in the world so that everybody would have a chance to express their genius. What a beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you. On this podcast, we celebrate great writing. And maybe you're ready to become a great writer yourself. Maybe you'd like to enroll in my writing school called Rite of Passage. This October, we're running our 11th cohort, and I'd love for you to join us. We make three commitments to students. You will publish quality ideas, find your people, and 2x your potential. And for this upcoming cohort, we've overhauled our curriculum based on half a decade of experience. And I'm convinced that this is gonna be our best cohort yet. We have limited seats, but you can save your spot today. Just click the link in the description, and I'll see you on the inside.